It's spoiler in time, ladies and gentlemen. On today's show, we are going to spoil The Shield, Episode 7, Season 5, Daredevil, Episodes 5 through 7, and Game of Thrones, Season 5, Episode 3, after we talk about the summer movie draft, and we hear from the one, the only, Brian Brushwood! Oh, man, dude, I feel like I should come out with a cape and, like, uh, bed- bedazzling myself uh, live on stage. Holy crap, man, we got a lot going on. Let's dive into the movie draft if we head on over. Uh, what? 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 Core three movie draft. 120 million. That's what Furious 7 has. Uh, well, well beyond expectations, Brian. $320 million. Now, keep in mind, we're creeping in on, uh, if you want to win, you want to be close to a billion dollars, which means you want to make about $10 million real dollars for every game dollar spent. And GFQ is freaking killing it in terms of Furious 7. However, Paul Blart uh, really just ate a bag of, 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 of crap. Yeah, $43 million. Um not a ridiculously low number for Paul Blart, but a little bit under, and certainly not the kind of like overproduction that would have helped lift GFQ into the you know like oh my gosh he's going to run away with this thing. Uh, so he's he's in first place obviously with three hundred sixty three million. He doesn't have another movie until Entourage. Then he's got Max, not Mad Max, just Max, and Magic Mike. Magic Mike's probably his best bet to stay in the running. But he's got a really big head start. Amtrucker's got Avengers Age of Ultron. He spent 80 bucks on it. Uh, at this point, it's going to make a lot of money. Can it make enough money for Amtrucker, though? No. Uh, well, I, and first of all, we, we've talked about this before. It looks like it's a two-man race between you and uh, t- uh, Team Amtrucker, or, or Team Jerks, who won the previous year. Uh, however, $80 for Age of Ultron is insane. Like in order for you to have a winning hand by the time this ends, he needs to he needs Avengers he needs to make, make eight hundred eight hundred million. That's insane. Well, not probably like six hundred million in all in all reality because it's not quite ten million that that you need. Well, no, no, no. I mean that's spend, that's but, your goal. Like the winning hand. Think but about even six hundred million is a lot. Yeah, think about it in terms of poker. Like the winning hand tends to be eight hundred million to uh, one point one billion dollars. Uh, and so with that in mind, uh, you know, eighty percent of his budget going to it. Uh, but but then again, you know, uh, how can this thing not make all the money on the planet? And I'll tell you what will be interesting is because it's already out internationally, it'll be interesting to see what kind of uh, foreshadowing that does as far as how well it's going to do. Also, do, have you seen any reviews come out since it's out in I've international? I've actually just talked to people who've actually seen it. Uh, so Patrick Beja saw it. Uh, and they are all universally saying not as good as Avengers. Now, some people say not as good as Avengers, but it was great. Other people say not as good as Avengers, and it kind of had some problems. Uh, and nobody's panning it. Nobody, that, well, may, I shouldn't say nobody. There are a few people panning it. Most people aren't panning it, but it's not getting that kind of excitement and buzz that will make you like, I have to see it. Same point we were talking about before the show. Uh, we all had a hard time finding acceptable seats pre-ordering weeks before it came out in the U.S., so they've already sold a lot of tickets. Yeah. Uh, by the way, people in the chat are saying uh, it'll make this much or that much worldwide. It doesn't matter worldwide. The uh, The yeah. draft is all about domestic U.S. So uh, I guess it, it's make or break. Uh, what are you predicting for the opening weekend for Avengers Age of Ultron? Well, I don't know about opening weekend. That's a good question. Uh, yeah, usually what, it's about, what, 50% of your total box office? Yeah, I think it probably makes $200 million. 200 million, something like that. It's yeah, going to be big. I'm going to say 223. That's my okay. that's my vote. What's your yeah. what's yours? Specific number. Go. 205 million. Okay. And $1. <laughs> and $1 <laughs> and 5 cents. <laughs> uh, hey, by the way, I went and saw X Machina. I, I talked about that on Cord Killers. Can, can, uh, can you spoil it just a little bit for me? Like I sure. under, I understand uh, if Let I'm me spoil reading the, the best leaves. part of the movie going in and Using this as my uh, my little pass to get in my oh, watch. Oh, that's awesome! So you're able to just to show off I your stuff. Di- I did it because I wanted to try it. I was like, let's see if this works. Fandango, here we go. Passbook. I got a QR code, uh, and I walked in. I'm like, will this work? And she's like, oh, cool. And then she like scans my watch, and the manager is standing there. He's like, oh my god, that's the coolest thing ever. That's He's awesome. Like, I haven't seen anybody do that yet. So it was kind of fun to be the first person. So there. if I'm reading the tea leaves correctly. Um, 
uh, much like a smaller robot story in a science fiction, you know, short story from the 1970s would have to do with a single robot. All of a sudden, by the end of the story, you know, it's an AI that's taken over, you know, 75 galaxies or whatever. Like, it sounds like something starts as a very small idea and gets very, very big. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. By the way, props to Bryce for, uh, as we threw him a curveball, throwing an X back in at the last minute, putting it up <laughs> on the screen. Nicely done, uh, sir. Well played. Good, good on your toes movement there. Uh, I'm putting it into the blog post right now as we speak. Anyway, uh, yeah, it is three characters, essentially. There is a few other minor characters, but you've got the young AI prodigy who gets called in to this remote location to meet with the tech guru head who is like pretty much a combination of Elon Musk, Sergey Brin, Larry Page, Steve Jobs, like – sure. You know, he's he is the the, you know, ultimate uh, eccentric, incredibly smart person. And he he created Blue Book, which is essentially a Google thing. And he's using the data from that search engine to create an A.I. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so the the premise is and if you don't want to be spoiled at all, you want to back out now. This isn't too spoilery, though. The premise is that this programmer that was invited to, to come and hang out is the Turing test. He's like, it's not really a Turing test in the classic sense because you know she's an AI, but that's what I want to see is even knowing she's an AI, can she convince you that she's human? And the rest of the movie plays out that concept very well. It's a, it's a limited set. It doesn't have a load of, of effects. I mean, the best effect is her body because it's obviously like a green screen suit that then they right. made look like a, a robot body. Uh, but it is a gripping storyline that is hard to predict what's exactly going to happen next. You know, uh, I, I don't think I'll make it out to the movie theater to see it. But if you think it's worth preserving, you know, keeping it in that box until I catch it on Netflix or whatever, then I'll, I'll hold off on doing that. It is. It reminded me of a lot of independent films that I have seen back in the Netflix DVD days. Sure. When I would like, just be like, like oh, primer, or that. upstream color, that kind yeah. of that kind of story. Totally. Oh, that's great. Then then I'm totally. in. Then don't tell me anything else. I'll I'll totally buy into all that. All right. Let's move on to Game of Thrones season five episode three, wherein Tommen is not nine years old like he is in the book, and therefore gets to have a much more enjoyable wedding. Night. Can I tell you, like, I did not expect to find and keep in mind, like, I'm 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 a grown ass man now. I you know I I just entered the same decade as you, Tom. We're both in our forties now, and so it's like I'm like, oh, how adorable! He's getting laid for the first time, and look at him. He really wants to do it again. And look at her; she's blowing him off. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, so much of the nuance that comes through in the books through uh, uh, overt methods. Uh, just just filters through. For example, you know, the way she uh, plays him a little bit and sort of drives a little bit of a wedge between him and his mom planting little seeds like, uh, oh, man, your mom's just uh, is going to love it here and she's going to love me and she, she sure loves you and uh, and so on. And then likewise, when we see Cersei coming up and being kind of blown off as she's the outsider as she tries to talk to Marjorie with her little gossipy group of hens. And of course, she's lying to all of them, talking about, oh, four times in one night, this guy, he's a real lion stag lion, you know. Uh, it, it So much of that was nuance in the book, but it just, it was, it was brilliantly executed in the TV show. Well, yeah, because in the book, they don't even have sex, right? Uh, and and uh, maybe minorly spoilery if you haven't read the book, but but he is a much younger person uh so she gives him cats that's where sir pounce comes from oh that's uh, right yeah i forgot so this, all about this, that this is a, and here's the thing all of the storylines in this episode for the first time are diverging from what actually happens in the books yeah uh, 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 spoiler uh, alert uh, uh real quick there there are people out there that don't realize um this is based on existing work this is not an original story uh, game of thrones is story, based though. on a well it's based on a series uh they're called the so a song of ice and fire by a guy named george r r martin i don't know if you knew this and uh uh, both Tom and I happen to have read the read the original source material, so we're, we may allude to how the current television show diverges from the source material. Uh, it, and and Jon Snow's segment is probably the closest to the books uh, in this, and I, I thought it was done well. I enjoyed seeing Jon Snow being the, you know, the the 
the guy, you know, the man in charge, and 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 living up to that, and and calling back to what Eddard Stark taught him, yeah, uh, in in executing Janice Slint, which he was set to be hanged in the original book, and it's changed a little bit, and this and that, but mostly it's the same. Every other segment here is departing significantly. Uh, maybe Arya's story is the next closest to the way it is, but man, uh, talking about the way it was in the books now really doesn't matter. Let's let's because go because we're moving off in totally different directions. Particularly Sansa Stark, who Shh. like her entire story is is very different. And now I'm sitting here wondering what's going to happen next. Let's just for our own you know giggles. Let's you and me uh, break it up in order from closest to the book uh, storylines. Let's start with the ones closest to the book and go out from there. I thought that Jon Snow uh, again in the book they they uh, it took a long time for you to see all the nuance of him being a great leader to come out and um, uh, and he is a great leader that inspires. He understands that he needs to get people on his side. He is uh, he's uh, very uh, cordial, uh, ex extending. Um, uh, what's the name of 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 the previous or the other front runner that uh, that he he does a good job of of making him feel uh, beloved. Yeah, it doesn't matter. A at any rate, but then but then you get the coward, the 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 bald coward with the beard, and uh, who tries to stand up to him. And then uh, I prefer the fact that he cut off his head because it did directly echo the lessons from Ned Stark, where he says, if you're going to pronounce the sentence, you need to draw the blade. You need to do this yourself. Alistair and, Thorne. Is that who you're thinking of? Yes, Sir Alistair. Yeah. That's, what, that's what I was thinking of. Alistair Thorne. Uh, uh, it was great in that regard. And I'll tell you what, I, I slightly divergent from the book, uh, I would say in that realm, the thing farthest from the book that we're seeing is um, uh, the development of Samuel Tarley. Uh, he's, you know, he remains a coward in the book, you know, the entire way through, but you sort of are seeing him man up in the television show, which I like a lot. Yeah. I, I don't know. I feel like that's true to his character in the book, just developing in a different way. Sansa to me is way farther than, than what, where she is in the, in the book. In the book, she's still cowering in the Eyrie. Uh, she's still kind of a milk toast. Doesn't really have a personality here. She is being pulled into an alliance with Ramsay Bolton. Uh, she is going back to Winterfell and having to pretend like she cares again, which is a direct reflection of the storyline with Joffrey, well, except in a much worse situation and not to her advantage. And she's doing it for a little finger. And yet, through all of that, I am getting the sense that she knows this time what the game is and intends to win. Well, and and that is something they did in the books. Is Littlefinger very much is educating her in the ways of duplicity about the way that you could say one thing and mean something else and to read read the the tea leaves, read read the cues. Uh, in the books, of course, and again, I'm sorry, there exist these books. Uh, it was Reek who marries fake Arya, which is so very different. It it, it accomplished the same structural thing, but uh, but it was, well, it was Ram Ramsay marries fake Arya. No, 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 because. Remember, remember they have to uh, they take Reek and they have to explain. Look, you're going to pretend to be uh, uh, uh No, no, no. You're going to pretend to be yourself, like uh, like. The, but but in your heart, you're Reek, and you'll always mm. be Reek. I'm looking and at the Wired recap, and it says Lord Bolton marries Ramsay to a girl they claim is Arya Stark. Uh, so maybe that she's got it wrong then. What? No, no, no. Maybe he just shows up. I thought. I thought. I thought. I know he does have to pretend to be Theon. Even yeah, though he is Theon. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No. 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 Then, then I'm I'm totally wrong. It was Ramsey, but I guess uh, Theon shows up to. Uh, I assume. But give anyway, his yeah, we're not getting the Jane Poole story, even though Jane Poole was introduced earlier in the series, making me think, oh, I know why they're showing us Jane Poole because we're gonna no. Nope. Oh, that's right. Uh, Still at work points out that that he gives her away. That's what it was. That's what. Yeah. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Now keep cool. in mind that one of the uh, let's let's step out for those of you who don't know. Not only is it based on a book, but also it turns out there's a thing called the media that leaks information. And one of the things that we've reported on is that the uh, the story of the television show will diverge from the books, and that characters will die on the television show. Well, who and didn't then that, die this is the, the episode where I start to feel like that is now made apparent, and it's not. The, the big controversy that I heard from people was they're going to divulge things that happen in the books before we get a chance to read them because George R. R. Martin hasn't written them or published them yet. I'm getting the sense now that it will be impossible to tell which are those things and which are things that are totally made off by Benioff and Weiss because we are starting to see all of these storylines diverge 
It particularly, I keep going back to Sansa because it's the most different from from what actually happens. And, and to be honest, and, I'm going to say Brienne. better. It is actually even more different than Sansa. It's just less important. But you can now not know if that new thing you're seeing is a revelation or an invention. Well, and, and don't care. It's better. It's it's it is a it is a better, tighter story to have Sansa be married off to uh, to, to to Ramsay Bolton with Littlefinger whispering, "Hey, man, you can get some vengeance because you'll be alone in the bedroom with him." By the way, my prediction is that Sansa tries to kill him and dies. Uh, uh, either it's that or awesome. maybe Brienne. I don't know. Uh, Brienne is on the case still with Sansa, so Brienne might come to her rescue. That's a good. That's a good merging of those storylines. Because why else make such a big deal about Brienne pursuing Sansa? Uh, meanwhile, we know without any uh, acknowledgement of previous existing source material that uh, 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 Stannis Baratheon is about to march south. Uh, he's yeah, going to okay. Can I, can I say uh, real quick, real quick, I cannot wait for this meme to develop. I want to see it. I want to see somebody do something on Reddit, and I want to see a response to it to be that brief moment after uh, Jon Snow cuts off uh, Jaina Slint's head's, uh, head, and, uh, and, and it cuts over to Stannis Baratheon, who just sort of looks, just gives the slightest little, little bit of a nod <laughs> and walks off. All right. That is dark and full of terrors. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was amazing. Uh, before we move off of Game of Thrones, though, we should acknowledge the incredible uh, presentation of cosplay. Oh, my God. Dude, whether you're a high septum who wants to pretend he's having sex with two of the, the, the seven gods, or you're in a brothel across the narrow sea, fake uh, fake dressed as a, as, as a booty show and uh, fake Khaleesi, which, by the way, I can't wait to see that at Dragon Con. There's going to be, I'm going to predict three of those. There's going to be three of those. Oh, in the evening in the Marriott. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, uh, at any rate, uh, it's it's awesome to see this meta thing where cosplay is a thing in the world of Westeros. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's move on to Daredevil. I have seen up through episode seven, Stick. So I'm going to talk mostly about Stick because I feel like that dominates the previous oh, episodes. Wait, uh, Although the one thing we didn't talk about much last time is the full, the the kind of uh, filling out of the character of Wilson Fisk. So can, I want to talk about that too. Can, can we real quick, uh, the one thing we didn't talk about in Game of Thrones, uh, mm. temporary Game of Thrones thing. Thrones Back thing. Game of Thrones. Oh, see, we, now we fake people out. Yeah. Who are well, looking at the, the thing. Look, and we like, just oh, warned them. We just warned them that we're about to talk about Daredevil. We gave extra warning. Mm. Uh, uh, they introduced the storyline of the Sparrows and of the, uh, the High Sparrow, who I spent the entire episode... Being like, I know that actor. Why do I know that actor? Why do I know that actor? And then this morning I woke up and remembered it was the main character from Brazil, uh, oh, the Terry nice. Gilliam movie. And, so uh, you don't you don't just look up on IMDb as soon as you have those thoughts? No, man. I'm old school. I'm 1980s about this Why stuff. Why you torture yourself like that? Give uh, me the future, Brushwood. I don't know. Keeps yeah. you young. Yeah. Trust yeah. me. <laughs> oh, my watch told me I have to stand up again. Okay. <laughs> Believe what Ex Machina tells you to do. <laughs> Let's go on to Daredevil. Yes. And Daredevil. Okay, so uh, briefly, let's talk about Wilson Fisk. Uh, and, and again, there, there may be some more Wilson Fisk stuff in episode eight, which I know you've watched. But mostly what we realize is that he, uh, you know, we talked about his, his deal with a car door uh, in the last episode. Yeah. Uh, and how he's able to go back to the woman from the gallery and still be like, no, but you, you I like. You, I wouldn't put your head in a car door and, and cut it off, uh, essentially. And this great little fake out scene where you think that the Mater D is betraying him, but in fact, he's doing the opposite. Is confirming, yeah, yeah. yeah he's 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 the one that's that's making sure you know, uh, 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 doing like a faux Judas thing for him. And then that moment where Fisk. Uh, Admits to her, like, yes, all of these explosions, uh, yeah, I'm responsible for that. Uh, it's for the good of the city. And she's like, hmm, well, okay. So, so how do you feel about, and I don't know if you read a, a lot of Marvel comics, but it's like, uh, you know, the Kingpin has usually been portrayed as an extraordinarily stoic, you know, just a lumbering rock. You know, this guy, you know, is unflappable. Whereas uh, we're seeing the emergence of this character, right? Uh, we're seeing the Kingpin as somebody who struggles with social relationships, who is having success but doesn't know his place. And he has he has a feeling of where he wants stuff to go, but not, not necessarily there. Like, um, 
D- does that bother you at all, or do you dig that? No, because in in all of his relationships with, you know, when he's on the phone with Daredevil, with Matt, with Matt uh, when he is dealing with his lackeys, he is kingpin. Yeah. He is that unflappable man. He is 100% confident in himself. What we're seeing is around the corner. We, we What we're seeing is a three-dimensional version where we're like, oh, we get to see this part of him that doesn't show up ever except when he's with her. And I think that's just cooler. It's basically saying, yeah, you just never got to see this side, but he does have it, and it makes him more real to me. Yeah, I think so too. I think it also makes him more believable because yeah. because you see his transformation into this unflappable thing. And by the way, we haven't finished the story, so it would seem to me that if I were going to craft a, craft a situation where I would make the kingpin an unflappable person, I would have him kind of fall in love with this girl, and I would kill her to make him this hardened shell of a man. But again, yeah, please don't say yeah, anything. Well, I don't know. She 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 could turn on him. Yep. He could turn on her. There's all all kinds of things, uh, and that makes sense uh, the other part of the story i guess before we get to stick is uh matt getting caught twice in what seems like a situation that he can't get out of right once with the cops uh having him in handcuffs uh, and then of course at the beginning of the next episode he's able to beat them all up and run away well but more uh, importantly they give a justifiable reason for why he would do that because yep. at, at the end of the first episode they're all like the cops have him surrounded he's like the cops are the good guys I can't kill them I can't whatever uh, and so it ends with him putting his arms up and then they handcuff him in the beginning of the next episode and then immediately they tip their hand by saying what about this guy and they blow his brains out and they say no witnesses and all of a sudden he knows all these guys are on the take all these guys are enemies enemies of the matrix and he and with his hands cuffed he kicks all of their asses i i gotta tell you tom i did not expect the action sequences to be as good as they are as consistently good as they are i mean yeah, uh, they are they are kung fu action movie level good yep uh and and i i, I read about this today that there's there's apparently like a particular kung fu series that they're emulating uh which i'm not enough of a, an, uh, I've seen some movies. I'm not in any way an expert on kung fu movies. But when I was watching him fight, I kept thinking of Drunken Master. I kept thinking of Bruce Lee. I'm like, these movements just seem like that kind of fighting where you're not always perfect, but you always recover and eventually prevail, which is what he does. Yeah. Well, and uh, and believably so, right? It's yeah. not it's not outrageous. Well, that- and the the imperfection is what makes it believable because, like, oh, he got thrown off balance. You know, he, he got you got he got punched a couple times. He's down, but he's able to recover. Not just be like, ah, oh, but you know, I, again, I I talked about it before. I always hate the fight scenes where like, oh, the hero gets beat up from the beginning until he's almost out, and then he he has a rally and he comes back and he beats the bad guy. It's never like that. It's it's much more even. Yeah. It's more like a tug of war than a uh, yeah. than than a ping pong match. And then of course there's the the deal with the cop who's not on the take in the warehouse. Oh, uh, heartbreaking, uh, right? Yeah. Does the and, right thing, gets rewarded with a, a friggin' knife to the throat. Yeah. Uh, and then there's the race to the tunnels. Uh, very interesting that they took out one of the dirty cops uh, because it certainly throws the the shade off of the dirty cops as being possibly, you know, somebody that the reporter has to see into. Uh, all kinds of good sideline stories here. I, I actually really enjoy uh, the abuela who thinks that uh, that the that, that, uh, um, masked oh, man. Um, baby Jessica, what's her name? Uh, the, you gotta uh, go. The what? secretary. Oh, the, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Karen, Karen. Karen, yeah. Karen. Who's baby Jessica in True Blood. Oh, God. Um, uh, Karen and, uh, <laughs> why can't I remember? Foggy. Foggy. Yeah, okay. I wanted to say Fern Gully for some reason. <laughs> Old Fern Gully and, and, got all and the baby right Jessica. <laughs> things. Just, okay. So, so, so baby Jessica and Fern Gully are getting together and it's kind of fun to watch the grandmother. Anyway, that was the, the longest side point I was ever going to make. <laughs> okay. So tell me this, tell me this. They seem to, uh, oh, oh, I guess since the last time we talked about it, one of my favorite little moments was, um. And I guess they talk. No, no, no. I guess that was episode four, the whole fax machine thing where he was uh, uh, pining for a future where he could have a fax machine and so on. And then got it. Um, do you think I, I I don't know how they're going to play it out. And again, we haven't finished the series. Uh, but 
it seems like they're getting closer and closer to where I feel like, like at some point, Matt has to let Foggy and Karen in on what's going on. He's already well, yeah, done. Yeah, I feel. I mean, we know. I think we know, right? Unless I read this wrong, that he does don the suit before the end of the season. Well, that's what it looks like from right. promo photos that we've seen, right? Yeah. And we, and so I would assume that at some point he's going to let his inner circle in on what happens. We've already seen that he will do it. He did it with Rosario Dawson. Right. Uh, and again, I apologize for not remembering her name in the uh, series. Claire. 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 Thank Look you. at me. Uh, guess who's master of names? This guy. Master <laughs> namer, Brian Brushwood. Uh, yeah, so tell me the name of the wind. You know, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it took me a second to realize what you were referencing. Uh, so, 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 yeah, I think he's going to do that. Uh, I love the character of Stick, though. I yeah, get, let's talk about this stick. because this is this is one of the things where they have the best of both worlds because we've talked before about how I'm just tired of origin stories. We know the origin stories to all these guys. This idea that you have to start at the beginning for every freaking thing and Daredevil doesn't do that. It starts midway. You got a dude who, you know, by day, blind lawyer, by night, kicking ass. And uh, and the fact that halfway through the season, they're able to go back and be like, how does a blind guy learn badass kung fu? But it's not even just halfway through the season. They have been doling out his origin story slowly, right? Yes. The very first episode starts with him being blinded, but then we just get, oh, and, and then his father was a boxer. Okay. Oh, and then he was an orphan. Okay. And then, like, we've been getting bits and pieces. So this is, like, 10 minutes into the origin story. Now Stick arrives and, and starts to be like, oh, okay, this is where he starts to learn some things. But even then we don't know because Stick leaves him. So we don't we don't know where he picked up the rest of it. Why did he continue to decide to be the the mask? Uh, you know how how did he, how did he create that identity and keep it separate from the lawyer? There's still more of that origin story to play out. Yeah, uh, tensor guy in the chat has the pithy statement that the whole series is an origin story, just not for Daredevil, which not I do just feel Daredevil. like yeah, it is. Right. Which let's talk about this because it really has been kind of the kingpin's origin story. But this is the moment we sort of take a side journey. We, we, we go off all of a sudden, uh, the stick episode, it's this very abrupt change where all of a sudden we're seeing a character brandishing a samurai sword, chopping off hands, demanding information and so on. And it turns out to be stick, which of course takes us back to, uh, more of, um, uh, of, of Matt Murdoch's origin story. Um, what, what, that, that was a bit of a break for me. I was not prepared for that big of a jolt. Did, did that register with you at all? Or you didn't care? I didn't care. I loved Stick so much. I just wanted to see more Stick. I wanted to see him, you know, speak his wisdom and be his gruff self and insult Matt to the point that he had to be like, that's what I wanted. I was insulting you to make you do exactly that. Like, it's a trope character. I get it. But it's so well executed. And they even provide just enough vulnerability to him. Just yeah. enough of that sense with the ice cream cone paper and him still having it on yes. him. That you're like, okay, this is a real person. Uh, and I've known people who are that jaded and cynical uh, and talented even. And he's trying to live through a code. Now, who's the master of that code is another tease at the end of that episode, which I don't know, you may have learned a little more about in episode eight. Yeah, uh, episode eight, uh, probably not a uh, minor spoiler for you, Tom. Uh, uh, he does a gig for Stick. Stick says, you know, hey, man. For Sticks, the uh, band, or for, Stick? For Stick. I said oh, Stick. Okay. I said Stick. Okay. Uh, by the way, well, you last- said gig, and that made me start <laughs> You gotta come sail away. He does a come gig with Sticks away, at the Paradise. Come sail away with me. Uh, real quick, who would win in a fight? Stick or Hundred Eyes? All right, let me throw a I twist at see, you. First of all, I want to see that. <laughs> so, first uh, of all, Stick, uh, 100 Eyes is armed only with a stick. Yeah. Stick is only armed with 100 Eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Who wins? Uh, I, I'm i going to say 100 Eyes, but uh, mm. that's a draw. Mm. That really is a draw. I think 100 Eyes has has him because they're both they're both the same character yeah. essentially yeah. but 100 dies is a little younger so he's got a little bit of a quicker step mm, but stick is from the future he has the internet at his side hmm that's a good point actually mm. Mm. Uh, can stick google new maneuvers <laughs> dark redeemer says stick wins cuz he's in a better show <laughs> take that marco polo 
<laughs> ah, d- okay, fine. Yes, Dark Redeemer, I think you've called it uh, stick wins. Uh, hey, let's talk about the shield, man. Where are you at on there? All right, man. So here's the thing. This is going to be hard for you. Yeah. Uh, I watch Man Inside. Man Inside ends on something that you know the truth about, but I don't. This is me. This is me doing my stone yeah. face. Ready? Okay. I'm engaging stone I'm actually face. trying not to watch, read the next episode description because uh, this is what, yeah, I don't really mind being spoiled. And frankly, if somebody spoiled me on this, I'd be like, you know what? I'm still going to enjoy the show. But I am savoring this moment because I know The Shield did it on purpose. Uh, and I'm almost, I almost went ahead and watched the next episode because of it. And then I'm part of me is like, yeah, but getting that seven day wait experience that everyone else had to have back then is kind of part of what they were intending. Uh, so what I'm talking about is at the end of man inside, which is essentially a wagon whims show. You have Vic Mackey's story being doled out in the background, Kavanaugh just nailing him, just pounding him against the wall. Cause at the end of the last episode, he learned about the 65,000 from Vic's ex-wife. Now he's like dividing them and you see his manipulations paying off as they all decide that they need to have different lawyers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you see the lawyer start to question Vic and, and the weakening of their case. You see him going after Aceveda and sowing doubts with Aceveda. You see the brilliance that is Kavanaugh, but it's in the background of this episode. Right. The entire episode is about capturing, uh, uh, the, the guy from San Antonio who is the murderer is, is his name Trayvon? What is his uh, name? Uh, I think it is Trayvon. Uh, something like that. Anyway. Uh, and you see Wagenbach pushing whims who, because she takes the initiative. She's like, no, I want to go after this guy because again, at the end of the last episode, we find a body that looks very similar to whims. In fact, the hair had been cut and altered to look like her. It's a very clear message. What's going on here? Uh, she's like, no, I want this guy. But then she starts to fade. And you see Wagenbach saying, look, I promised I wouldn't bring up the sickness. I'm not going to bring up the sickness. I'm just going to I'm just going to support her and, and encourage her. And so it's this cat and mouse game where they're like in the investigation room for the majority of the episode, just beating him up, trying to get him, trying to crack him, uh, trying to show him things until the point where they get Fatima to agree to pretend to be dead so they can show him a picture and crack him and break him. And at one point, she's like, I can't do this. I, I am exhausted. I can't do this. And Wagenbach says, uh, you told me not to let the sickness uh, affect me. Don't let it affect you. And she's like, no, I can't. You know, and she rallies. She gets back in there. She breaks him. He admits to the murders. They've won the case. She walks out the door, passes out, falls down the steps, and at the end of the episode, other than a, a thing, a, a, a slight note about look at her neck, you have no idea what condition is she in. Is she dead? Is she alive? Is she unconscious? Is she going to be a vegetable? You don't know what's happening with whims. This is me continuing. And that's why you can't say anything. My stone face. This is, <laughs> uh, because I'm glad you're enjoying. Uh, uh, let me read this message my lawyer gave me. Okay. Uh, we are thrilled that you're enjoying The Shield. We hope you continue to enjoy The Shield through the remainder of the seasons that lay ahead of you. Uh, thank you. Yes, I, I, I look forward uh, to watching it as soon as we're done talking here. Like, <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm getting myself all worked up again because it is, it is a really... Yeah, there's cliffhanger endings like that where you're like, oh, is she dead? And there's there's times when you know, like, well, the story can only allow one way. I mean, it's, way. Cer- it's certainly right. like uh, y- your point is no matter what happens next, that moment had a very clear, powerful impact on you. It was a gut punch for yeah. you. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so so well done. The shield and 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 without letting the the other art story arc uh, sag at all. Like it was moved forward in, in, in incredibly important ways. And, and side note, one of the best ways was that Vic Mackey is actually a good guy sometimes because he sits down with his wife and says, tell them everything. Tell them, just, just save yourself. Don't worry about me. Yeah. And, and it's like, that is the right thing to do. And it's not a smart thing to do, but it's the right thing to do. And Vic is just got enough of an ego to think that he can overcome that and still do the right thing. But you got to admire him for doing the right thing. Yeah, man. 
Uh, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit distracted because for those of you watching live, we have two bots that are arguing in the chat right now. <laughs> Showbot Reminder is arguing with DCTV bot, and it's one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. Uh, but I guess uh, I guess we'll see more <laughs> of the Shield next week. That's right, folks. We will spoil you like you've never been spoiled before. Talk to you then. Heck yeah, we love you. Kisses. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>